All right. So uh, I, I, I've been worried that um, I'm making your gl eyes glaze over. <laughs> so I want to be very practical, and we're gonna, I'm going to pose a couple questions, and we're going to go down through that outline a little bit, but in a very practical way. Um, and, uh, but mostly, I want to talk about how to disagree without being disagreeable. All right. And uh, there's a couple of great books, and, and, and I'm going to give you a scenario tonight. Uh, this is a hypothetical, uh, and then we'll, we'll talk through it. Um, and I'm just going to make this up off the top of my head, okay? Ready, set, go. Uh, so, um, you're a faithful Christian, you go to church. It is your understanding uh, that, that uh, the gay lifestyle is uh, not scriptural uh, and, and uh, your son calls you from college and he says, uh, uh, Dad, I, I, I'm coming home for Thanksgiving and I'd, I'd like to bring my boyfriend. Um, and you're a little surprised. Uh, and so, you know, that leads to a long conversation and uh, you have to deal with that. How, as a Christian, as a parent, uh, do you deal with that? And then let me just keep pushing because that's always fun. <laughs> uh, and then, you know, they come home for Thanksgiving and... Um, and it's pretty serious and, and you know, you tried to set some boundaries. We'll talk about if that's something we should do or not do. We'll do you know, we're going to do this hypothetical. We're going to think through it. Uh, and then uh, right, right after Thanksgiving, you've en enjoyed, you know, uh, your second glass of Cabernet and, and the, the turkey stuff that makes you sleep is kicking in. And just when you think you're going to keel over, they say, oh, by the way, we're, we're going to get married in the spring. Now what do you do? Just a little bit of a thought there. Now, you're a Christian, you're a parent, uh, and I'd love to tell you this is completely hypothetical. But this is as real as it gets. It happens a lot. Uh, and I should also tell you, um, you know, pastors get to know a lot of stuff about families. Uh, and, and, I, and I mean this in the most gentle way possible, that this church is full. I don't mean one or two. Full of families that are dealing with us right now. Full. Uh, it's, it's almost part of our... It, it's become a cultural thing, you know what I mean? Um, and if we don't, as Christians, know how to deal with this new reality, uh, and may be short-lived uh, or it may last 50 years for all we know, unless we figure it out and how to talk about it, you're going to lose your children. And what you want to ask yourself is this. Is your decision, the last thing you say to your child, do you want that to be the last thing you say? It, is that Christian parenting? Do you want to never see your child again based on some decision you make? So there's what we're going to have to deal with, okay? Is that practical enough for everybody? Okay. <laughs> so let's think about this now and just go wind it back and go through some of the categories we've had. Um, but I want to give you, before you forget, um, there are two books or two writers. Uh, one is named, her name is Rosaria Butterfield. Rosaria Butterfield. And I'll give you a quick uh, introduction to her. Uh, PhD. Uh, English literature professor uh, at Syracuse University and eventually the professor of 
uh, queer and feminine studies. Moves in with her partner next door, and this is always dangerous to a Presbyterian minister. And for years, ends up in that pastor's house, sneaking into church once in a while, enjoying meals, and the pastor totally opens his home to them. Today, Rosaria Butterfield is the wife of a Presbyterian minister. Read her book. Uh, she's written several. Um, and there's nothing you're going to tell her about queer studies. Just nothing. She was one of the uh, foremost uh, experts in queer studies in America. Uh, you went to Syracuse University to get your PhD from her. Uh, so the Lord saved her uh, and, and changed her life. And it's worth reading. And then I'd like you to read Talk the Walk. Talk the Walk, uh, Steve Brown. Um, this, this, uh, <laughs> Steve Brown, of course, is another Presbyterian <laughs> pastor, PCA pastor. Um, and uh, it, it's just important to know how to talk to people. Um, remember what the scriptures say. Weep with those who weep, mourn with those who mourn. Uh, and if we can't be brokenhearted with people over the issues in their life, we're never going to have an audience with people. Just, it's never going to happen. It's never going to happen. So it's, it's okay to be knowledgeable that the scriptures do teach that the gay lifestyle will be ultimately destructive for those involved. Um, but it doesn't teach you to be a jerk about it. So we have to learn to talk to people in a way that's helpful. Um, forgive me, I'm, I, I guess I'll just have to say it uh, so I can get over this so I can talk. One of my best friends growing up, uh, we all went to church together and he was gay and of course we knew it. I mean, you know, we always know. <laughs> And, and, uh, but, and he tried really hard, and um, uh, he married a friend of mine, uh, and she sang at our wedding. Beautiful voice. Um, but he, co he couldn't overcome it, and it destroyed his life, and a, a year ago they found him dead on the floor in his home. This stuff hurts people. You know what I mean? It hurts people. Uh, and so we want to talk about it this way. Uh, and at least at our church, um, I'm going to discourage you from talking about it with a placard in your hand. It's not the way to go. It's not the way to go. But I can testify to you uh, that uh, in Philadelphia, I have had more of these conversations than I can even count anymore. And I have never one time had anyone in the gay lifestyle resist the conversation. Not once. Because of the approach. Not one time. Not one time. I've had a lot of Christians be silly about it. But never, I've never had a problem. Um, so, remember the creator-creature distinction. What we're trying to say is that there is a structure to the universe because there's a creator. And that that structure, if violated, will end up hurting anyone who violates the structure. And that structure is just as uh, real as gravity. Uh, and so we know, uh, scripturally, that the gay lifestyle uh, is not merely about sexuality, but that that sexuality is an expression of something else going on in the heart. And that heart issue 
is going to be one that will not cause you to flourish before the Lord in the way that the Lord has for you as his image bearer. The sexuality, you have to understand, is an expression of something else. Uh, and so that's what you have to have a conversation with people about. Uh, and, and I always talk about it in that way. Uh, I always talk about it, I say, if you're an atheist and believe in evolution, large E, and that is the ultimate explanation of everything, then you still have to admit that there's a problem because uh, the gay lifestyle would mean that the end of the human race. So there's some basis that's more than merely spiritual. There's a virtual genetic basis to this that God has put into the universe. And so that's, you know, what we want to talk about. But let's talk about the scriptural ground. I, uh, I'm going to stand up, Kelly, to warn the camera. I have to walk over here. Larry's crying. I want to give him a... Uh... Where all right. <laughs> Don't get it bad. All right. So what are the scriptural boundaries? There are three words I want you to remember. Uh, compromise, concerned, and considerate. So th the scriptures don't ask us to compromise. Uh, but the, the scriptures don't ask us to be unconcerned or inconsiderate either. <laughs> right? So here, here are the, uh, some verses for us that we have to balance. Uh, remember at the end of uh, Romans 1, 32, uh, there's this long description. We read it at the beginning of the class. Uh, and it was a long list of different sins, right? And with, embedded in that list uh, was uh, homosexuality. But it, it was a long list of sins. Uh, and I always tease people a little bit and challenge Christians, how come that's the only one on the list that I see you marching around the courthouse with a placard about? It'd be great if I could say, you know, down with faithfulness, uh, faithlessness, you know, down with lying, <laughs> down with godlessness, down with robbery. Never get it. I want to get that one. I, I, and you have to challenge yourself. Why? Why? Why are you so concerned about that one? Now, yes, it's a concern, but why did you pick that one out? Uh, but nevertheless, we have to deal with the fact uh, that the phrase ends this way. Paul says they not only do them, in other words, this long list, but give approval to those who practice them. All right, so that's going to be one of our boundaries. We, we, we can't approve of something that is sin. And remember what sin is. Sin, sin isn't an arbitrary moral rule. Sin is the thing that separates you from your creator. creator. And anything that separates you from your Creator ultimately destroys you. Ultimately. So that's one of the boundaries. Uh, and then in Matthew 9, uh, those uh, who are well uh, have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. This is uh, the one little phrase. Remember, Jesus is eating with the sinners and the prostitutes and all the bad people that you're not supposed to hang around. You're not supposed to be caught with them. Uh, and uh, he is challenged by the religious types. How can you possibly hang out with those people? And Jesus' answer is, well, uh, those who are well have no need of a physician. They don't need me if everything's going well. So Jesus was willing uh, to hang out with people for the sake of their ultimate uh, soul. So that has to be a category like Rosaria Butterfield. Um, who spent uh, multiple years in that Presbyterian pastor's house, um, eating, being welcomed, uh, not feeling judged once. She'll, you read her testimony, or her book, and you can go on YouTube and she'll, if you'd like, prefer to see her speak. Um, so that's another boundary. And then a boundary because I put this verse in because this is the passage for Sunday. Uh, but in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy. Not honor Christ the Lord as, like, as holy. He's holy. Uh, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. How do we do that, though? Yet with gentleness and respect. That's the approach.
So yes, we're prepared to give a defense for what the hope that's in us. This is why uh, we think about it this way. But how do we do that with gentleness and respect? And the, and, and the category I always use is I say, well, you know, a, a lot of Christians uh, do say what Jesus says. And you get credit for that. But the problem is they say what Jesus says, but they don't say it the way Jesus said it. Uh, and now you lose credit on the exam for that. <laughs> right? <laughs> so that's, that's, that's the balance uh, we want to have. We speak truth, but we speak it in love. Speak truth in love. So that balance is what we're after. So, uh, remember what our question is. Your son comes home, uh, and uh, it's Thanksgiving, and he calls, and he says, I'd like to bring my boyfriend. Uh, and... Uh, and then he gets there, and after a second glass of Cabernet and the turkey is kicked in, they announce that they'd like to get married in the spring. And so now you have a, an option. You either reach for the scotch and, and you know, go, go hide in, 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 in your man cave, <laughs> or you have to think about this, right? So uh, we have three spheres of the way that the Lord rules, remember? And we could and sphere <coughs> sovereignty and it's a covenant with family, covenant with church, and uh, a covenant with the state. And these are the only three uh, spheres that the scripture uh, uses. Uh, uh, now we're obviously here in a in all three, aren't we? Think about this. Think about this now for a minute. Because we're going to have to go back to it. You're obviously in the sphere of the covenant with family. Uh, the Lord rules. The Lord expresses his, uh, uh, his uh, authority. And the Lord expresses his will. Primarily, ver the very first thing is through the family. That's... So, you have to ask yourself... Am I willing to break the covenant of family? Am I willing to dislocate a member of the covenant community, which is my family? So start with that. Start with that. Now, don't get me wrong. I know how kids are. They might break it with you when you don't want them to, right? <laughs> Well, let's just keep this on the, let's keep it on the parent side for now, because it's complicated. I mean, honestly, it's complicated. But you also have the covenant with the church, because the Lord uh, expresses his will uh, through the community of faith. And so now, you also are dealing in an area where, uh, how does the community of faith uh, handle this? Um, uh, does, d does the church sanction the wedding? Uh, does the church sanction the relationship? Does the church say um, God loves all of his children and uh, God made them the way they are? And so, of course, we have to extend our love to them. That's the argument, by the way, just so you know. That's how it works. Don't worry, we're going to get back to all this. And this one also affects the covenant with the state. Because the state now is going to issue a marriage license for this. Right? So we're in every category so far, right? We haven't, we're not missing any on this one. <laughs> so we have to, we have to uh, start thinking uh, through this, all right? Before we get to the response. So now, let's think about what the gospel uh, is. What is the gospel? We talked about every position has a good news offer. And they will have a creation narrative, a creation story. They'll have the fall. You know, what, what, this is what, uh, what went wrong. Uh, and then this, there'll be a story of redemption, which means, you know, what cures the problem. 
and then there'll be a story of consummation. And, th and that is, you know, uh, what is, for lack of a better, what does perfect look like? What does perfect look like? And every position that's taken uh, is an offer of good news. It's, it's the gospel, uh, no matter what. It's just either a false gospel or the gospel of Jesus Christ. So now, you, you know, you're going to have to think about, okay, how are we going to talk to my son about this? And, and what, what kind of things you're going to say to him? And how are you going to help him think about it? So, uh, you know, and again, I, don't, I have not had this uh, personally in, um, you know, in my family. So, I'm what the gay lifestyle says is this. That uh, you make uh, yourself the way you need to make yourself. I need to be me. Um, and, and so you become your own creator. Uh, that's the narrative. It used to be the narrative, and it's changed. It used to be that God made me this way. That used to be the argument. Uh, but the minute that we moved towards uh, gender identity issues, that argument didn't work anymore. So now you're not going to hear that. You're going to hear, I need to create myself the way I need to create myself. I need to express myself the way I need to. Uh, and what that is going to be talked about, if your son is sitting with you, he's going to say something like this. He's going to say, the real me in me needs to get out. Uh, and either you know, my sexuality or my gender identity or something is inhibiting the real me from from letting loose. Uh, and I won't be the real me until this happens. That's the creation story. That's how we get there, right? And of course, as Christians, we're saying that God created all of us in His image. Every single person. And because that's true, uh, we have a structural uh, uh, connection to our Creator. Uh, and that is sort of just the opposite of what you're going to hear in that conversation. Uh, however that gets expressed, those will be the two ideas that you'll have to deal with. Okay? Uh, so if, this, if you think this conversation will last about, you know, 10 minutes, think more on the order of years. <laughs> think more on the order of this is going to take a long time. All right? Uh, what is the what, what went wrong? So you know, in the in in the in the gospel story, you know what went wrong was we rebelled against our, our Creator, obviously. Uh, but uh, what happened here? Uh, what went wrong is I failed to realize uh, how central my sexuality was to my identity, uh, and and I got that wrong, uh, and now I understand. And I'm identifying that way. And so that connection, and it might not, you know, I might not have said exactly, the, and I want to be fair to anybody who would want to say that, but there will be the connection to sexuality and identity, and these things somehow have been dislocated, and that's, that's what went wrong here. That's what went wrong. And it, it will come out in different ways. You know, they'll say, well, you know I, I, you know, I knew that I didn't fit in as a little boy from the time I was five. It might come out like that. Or uh, uh, I, we, uh, I had a, a, um, a friend in Philly who was uh, gay and uh, uh, had a daughter, been married for many years, and it, he decided that after a lot of years of marriage, uh, that uh, this is a, a, a truth for him that just he needed to express and hadn't realized it all this time. And so it was, he never pointed back to, you know, I was five years old. He always pointed to later on in his life. Uh, and, uh, but that's, that's going to be the fall. That's going to be, the, the, that's going to be what went wrong. And of course, we're, we're saying as Christians, well, we were created in God's image, and what went wrong is we decided we sort of wanted to be God. All right? So the, the, that's the gospel. 
Uh, the redemption, obviously, is kind of obvious because the redemption is always the flip side of the coin of whatever the fall is, right? So in this instance, we're going to say that the, the, the way that I, I, I am now uh, cured from my identity uh, 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 problem is to celebrate my identity, right? And we're going to call that coming out. Uh, and, and, and coming out is not an accidental uh, phrase. Uh, it's a celebration. And the reason you celebrate is because you're cured, <laughs> right? You, you, the problem is now fixed. And, and, and from now on, things are going to be great. And I'm, I, 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 I no longer have to feel inhibited. I don't have to feel like I'm under attack. I, you know, this is something that's been important to me. And that's going to be the redemption part of the story. Of course, as Christians, our redemption story is that our, our full identity is only ever realized to the extent that we are in union with Christ, who is our all in all. All right? But just so you know what that is. And now, what's the consummation uh, of the story? The consummation. What will be perfect? And I remember I read you that stuff from the very first class. We will not be satisfied. Remember, I read it directly out of, out, out of the textbook. Uh, we will not be satisfied until everybody celebrates uh, this with us. Which is why, by the way, this has gotten political. Um, and and um, that, that's sort of what, you know, you know we had, we had uh, homosexuality as a lifestyle uh, in the first century. You know, that, I mean, that's what the Bible references. You know, this was not new news. But what is a little bit different now for us, and we have to think about how we're going to do this, is that now uh, consummation means that we live in a world that celebrates our lifestyle with us, which is why you've been getting the legal actions. So, you know, if a, you know, if a Christian um, uh, bakery doesn't want to make the cake uh, for the wedding because it violates their conscience, then instead of just walking away and saying, okay, what's right for you is right for you, and what's true for you is true for you, they don't want what's true for you to be true for you. They want what's true for them to also be true for you, and I'm going to sue you, and you are going to make that stinking cake. And, and, and so they, they end up in court. All right? That's the consummation, because consummation means that, remember what consummation is. Consummation is heaven. Consummation is the new heavens and the new earth. So the new heavens and the new earth in this lifestyle is that that, uh, that lifestyle not only will be um, allowed and tolerated, but that lifestyle will be celebrated, which is now why you have uh, uh, human resources departments and corporations demanding uh, that uh, employees wear rainbow flags on you know, particular months and things of that sort. Uh, it's, that's why it's gotten to that level. And that's what's new. That's the new part. All right, we've had everything of, the, of this before. The new part is now it's gotten so political. And this is what we have to think about as Christians. And, and, I'll, and, I'll, and I'll tell you some of my thinking um, um, that I've had for years about this and, uh, and then how some of it, I've had to change it a little bit uh, because of that, of that key thing. All right, so th those are the basic categories. Let's make sure we understand the categories. All right. Are there any questions about the covenantal? This is small c, the covenantal rules, right? It's Christ of the covenant. There's one covenant between God and humanity, but he expresses that, that's large c, in the small c's of covenant with family, covenant with the people of God, and covenant through the state, because we, we want to talk about that as well. Everybody happy with all that? All right. So now let's think through this. Remember, your son. It's your son. Because we're going to have to ask the question here pretty soon. You're going to go to the wedding? Oh, somebody's like, yep. <laughs> uh, okay, just for the fun of it. Now, you've got to be honest. No one can see your hand on camera. <laughs> don't answer... I want to do a little poll, and don't answer what you think I want you to say. I don't care what you say. I mean, I don't, that sounded bad. I didn't mean it. <laughs> I don't mean it that way. <laughs> I mean, it's not going to influence me, 
right? How many think, before we go any further, I'm going to the wedding? One, two, three. Wow, okay, that's actually the majority. All right. Uh, how many think um, um, this is too close to call? I'm going to find some sort of middle ground here. I, and I'll give you an example of what that might be, just because that's hard to think about. All right, I, I, I can't go to the wedding. We have to have some boundaries. I'll tell you what I'll do I'll buy a nice present, and I'll show up at the reception. <laughs> I mean, that might be, I don't know, you know, I'm just making this up a little bit. How many would take the middle ground? I can't go all the way, but I, I you know, I'm not going to abandon you completely. Any middle ground people? Okay, a couple. Okay, yeah, we're good. All right, we got middle grounds. All right, now how many just like, as a Christian, can't go, can't be there no matter what? Any of those? Okay, a few of those. Okay, all right, good. All right, fair enough. Ah, uh, isn't it great to be in the unity of the Spirit here at First Church? <laughs> Uh, now I'm going to give a, I'm going to give it away ahead of time because um, uh, um, I don't want you to be in a lot of attention, uh, but I want to tell you what I think is the answer to this, um, and then we'll talk it through. Fair enough. Uh, this is in the category of some can eat meat and some can't, which means. Uh, you're going to have to be wise about it based on who you're dealing with. And I'm going to go through the biblical passages and we're going to talk about this, all right? So, in other words, some of you might say something like this. Well, okay, I, could, uh, I, I cannot see myself not going to my son's wedding. But I might have to turn down a colleague at work. And certainly someone who I don't actually know very well at all that maybe I went to school with. You might have that kind of a line. Why? Covenant with family. Uh, uh, some of you are going to say, uh, I am in such a position in life that I can't be seen uh, at, at a wedding. Now, I can't, I can't go to a gay wedding. You understand that? I can't ever go, personally. Why? Because I can't be seen to approve. Because I, everybody knows that I'm a minister of the gospel. So I can't do a gay wedding, and I can't go. Uh, for, no, for no other reason, what's that? Should we? You won't marry, but we're supposed to... Well, let's get... To, he hasn't told us... I, I haven't said yet. Uh, well, in this church... Huh? You won't in this church. Oh, no, no, no. But we're supposed to go to some other church to see our son get married. I didn't say that. Uh, you, didn't, you, didn't, you didn't even listen to the first sentence before you got mad. All right, so let me recommend Talk the Walk by Steve Brown. <laughs> so uh, what I said in this section is, uh, that's all right, uh, that some, uh, you remember what Romans says, some can eat meat, some can't. Some can have wine, some can't. And so... Uh, this is going to be an, a decision of wisdom that you're going to have to make uh, in various categories. And what we're trying to do is make sure you have the biblical tools to make a decision because there's a great line in the Westminster Confession that says this, that God alone is Lord of the conscience. God alone is Lord of the conscience. And so you have to serve the Lord, faithfully apply Scripture to your life, and make decisions uh, regarding that. And some of them are on the edge. Right? And you have to factor in a whole bunch of stuff uh, in doing that. And then the rest of us, so say, David, you can't go to a wedding. You just can't bring yourself to do it. Um, and someone else in the body of Christ says, you know, I think I can find a way because of my relationship with this person and because I've made it clear to them that I believe that this is dishonoring to the Lord, but nevertheless, I want them to know that I still love them and care for them. Uh, and we've had a, a relationship now for 20 years together. And they know very well that I do not approve of this in any way. Uh, you, that person might be able to say, well, uh, they can go. 
And what you and that person can't do is get in a fight that, may, that I have to break up. <laughs> right? It's got you know, to be <laughs> that kind of approach. So, you, do you want to follow up before we do some Bible verses? I've been through some of this, and I've had friends that say I will refuse to go to my daughter or my son's Yeah, yeah. And I'm just saying, the church says we're not going to marry you, but the parents right. are supposed to deal with you. you know, we're supposed to do it. We have a lot of good stuff going on. But it's got to be a gay church when you get married, you know, so. Okay. I'm just saying the church says no, but they leave it right to us to deal with, which is fine, but. Well, that's right. And, and you can't get married in this church. That's correct. Right. So, um, so be, and I'm okay with that. And the reason for that is because of the covenant of the family. Right. And it's, it's you have to, the Lord never called the church to be the father of your, of your household. He called you to do it. He called the church to give you the tools to make a godly decision in your home. So those things are not intention, and you can't actually blame that. Uh, the reason why... Uh, let, let, I'm sorry, go ahead. So if your husband would not go for gay marriage, then the wife would not be able to... I would be very cautious about doing that, yes. That's why I'd have to go. <laughs> <laughs> but I appreciate the point that Maria is making. Because of the covenant with the family, the family has to be in unity. Uh, and, and, and if the family is not in unity, now, now the, that covenant is getting broken over something. Uh, and, and so, uh, you know, I, if you were coming to sit and ask me, I'd say, Guys, you really have to agree on this one. You have to agree on it. But the, why? So let's just appreciate Dave's point because he's making a, a fair point here. Why can't why can't the church perform the wedding? By the way, there's all there, you know who you know how many churches will perform that wedding in America now? Uh, most of them. No, hardly any of them. Oh, I, I, no, 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 no. We're not there yet. I don't expect. There's only one denomination. There's only one denomination in the country that will do it. And everybody else, uh, if you hear of them doing it, they're doing it in violation of the denomination. What you're hearing is that um, the denominations are fighting over this, and they are. But so far, the only denomination in the country that has sanctioned same-sex marriage is the United Church of Christ. Uh, what you know is the Congregational Church. But, I should tell you, to make David's point, the rest of them are fighting about it. <laughs> I think the part that's disturbing to me is that you've got to say goodbye to your son. Well, let's, let's, let's hold on to that. It's a rough part because they're, yeah. if they're shoving it down your throat, that you're no good because of that. And then, right. and yeah, then let, yeah, that's a pretty big hypothetical, but let's, let's see if we can, let's see if we can, can you hear what David's concern is? Yeah, okay. Because it's a fair concern, because that's, that's the heart of a lot of what's going on. But I, I do want to sneak into this a little bit, if I can. Uh, I want to give us two categories to think about this. But remember, the covenant of the family, what David's concern is, and it's a, right, a fair concern, is how does this affect now the covenant with my family? I have a son... Uh, who is, uh, is, in some sense, breaking that covenant with the family. And I should also say, as a, as a, a man, um, it, is, it is much easier, if I can put it this way, David, it would be much easier uh, for me to talk with your son if he was gay than to talk to my son. It would feel different. And you just have to face that. That is part of the deal. And part of what uh, fathers, Christian fathers who are facing this, part of what they're feeling, and it's hard to separate and tease it out, is uh, if this was the best friend's son, they would be a better Christian than if it was their son. <laughs> right? Because that hits so hard at 
the core of you know a father and son relationship that that a lot of fathers are going to struggle with that on a whole different level and if it were not their son they'd handle it you know much better so it's an extra and I and I slipped the mickey into this conversation on purpose the reason I didn't use the example of you know your best friend's son does this is because it doesn't hurt as much <laughs> you know it, it, it hurts a lot more right so the covenant of family is broken but the covenant with the church, like David said, is also broken because that, that child who wants to get married, why can't the church perform the wedding? What does it violate for the church? Is it just a, you know, just because it's in Romans 1, what does it violate? And you have to be clear on the reason, otherwise it will always be a wishy-washy thing for you. Do you know what it is? It's the very first thing. It violates the creator creature distinction. What we're saying is that the very first marriage was not uh, something that happened civilly. The very first marriage was part of the created order in the Garden of Eden. And the very uh, first marriage was a man and a woman created by God. And that establishes God's intention for the family. It's structural. And so the church says we cannot violate the creator-creature distinction and say to God, the one uh, relationship that you sanctioned from all eternity, from the very beginning of creation, we're just going to ignore that can't do it. So we can never do that wedding. Can never do that wedding. Uh, which is why it's taken so long, even within liberal denominations, that they still haven't crossed the line and officially sanctioned it. Because it is, it is, an, it is not merely a cultural convention. Uh, for instance, if, you know, we talked about head co coverings in 1 Corinthians 11 and stuff like that. You know, that would take no problem to pass that in any you know, denominational assembly, five minutes. They'd be like, that's a cultural convention, don't worry about the head covering, right? But the reason that this has been so profoundly uh, in, in, in um, I, I guess I can't do that on tape. But the reason this has been so profoundly uh, uh, intractable, even in liberal denominations, is because of the creative creature distinction. It's just hard to get around it. It's just hard to get around it. Um, so that's the covenant of church. What does that alter if the gay marriage? It alters what? The authority of the covenant, right? So th the family alters the definition. If this alters the definition of the covenant, and this alters the authority of the covenant, because it, it was like Dave and I were talking. Uh, the, the church can never be the parent. I am not, I cannot discipline your children. I cannot, <laughs> I, can't, I can't get, you know, we, we have no power for that at all. What we have is the authority of the gospel to instruct. And all we have, and the only authority is in the gospel. And, you know, I tell people this all the time, and, and it's a foregone conclusion, but I have no personal authority as your pastor. Steve means nothing in your life. Nothing. The only authority is the gospel. Right? So what happens in churches that go sideways, just as an example, is that the pastor talks about baseball and everybody's like, oh yeah, you hear what he said? That was great. And they take that down like he's teaching the Bible. And then, and of course that's cute, but this is when it gets really bad. And what did he say about politics? And all of a sudden, you're in deep water that you cannot be in. All right? The only authority is the authority of the gospel to instruct. But all the authority of the family, that covenant, it stays in the family. All the church does, is I can put it this way, is we advise the family. That's what we do. And you can take the advice or not. You can take the instruction or not. Now, the Lord says, we really hope you take the instruction because it really is good for you. 
But remember, the authority is not resident in anything except the gospel. It's the gospel that has authority, all right? So what, what does the gay wedding do? It, first of all, it, it attacks the definition of the covenant of family. Instead of uh, being the creation ordinance of a man and a woman, it now says that uh, what God has joined asunder, uh, uh, together, man can definitely put asunder if, it, if he feels like it. What God has put together, let no man put asunder, is in there because of the creation, not because of a cultural convention a thousand years later in Israel. It's from the very get-go that God created the system to work this way. So the very definition of covenant is broken in the gay wedding. But the authority of the church is broken in the gay wedding because the gospel uh, also says that this is going to hurt you and you will not achieve re a reconciliation with God this way. And so it's a denial of the gospel. So that covenant is broken. And now what's the problem with the covenant of the state in the gay wedding? It's the license. Because all you have to do now is say, uh, this is completely a state problem and the church is cut out of its authority position. And so it doesn't matter if you're a Christian and part of the people of God, you're going to make the cake and we'll take you to court if you don't. Uh, if you are a minister of the gospel and you describe the scriptures, all you have to do is read them out loud. You don't even have to like, teach them. Just read them out loud and you'll be called a hater. We don't hate anybody. We disagree that that lifestyle is going to, to be as productive for you as you think it's going to be. In fact, we think it's ultimately going to cause uh, a lack of human flourishing. Uh, it will not be the glory that you want it to be in the end. Uh, and so, but if you can't say that without being a hater, and so the state replaces the authority of the church. So that's why uh, the gay marriage attacks every one of the covenants. Does that make sense? So far, so good? So do, do you understand where the lines are on these covenants? Uh, so, yeah, so... It's probably a problem on that. It's not a problem you have. Like no, oh, no, no, no. No, the, uh, it's not a problem. No, no, no. You're not getting it. You're not getting it. Slow down. You're responsible for God for your family, not me. That's what you have to get. It's all on you. Uh, and, and the church is here to instruct you with the gospel. But at the end of the day, you're going to stand before the Lord with what you did in your family. Not me. Uh, and the state now has intruded into the family and into the church. And that's why it breaks the covenant there. Because what, what did the Lord say the state could only do? It only could wield the power of the sword to do what? To restrain evil in the world. Which means to protect you from, you know, the bad people. <laughs> from being ambushed and, and stolen from and, you know, all those things. And so uh, I always tell people, you know, a father, a father can discipline his child. Uh, the church uh, can instruct the children uh, uh, if the parents say so, uh, and, but the state can execute them. Right? Uh, sadly. <laughs> Go ahead, Patty. Yeah. We are the church. Yes. And so, if the church may not um, perform these weddings, why is it that if I am part of the church, why would I um, attend one of those? Uh, yes, that, that's actually a great question. Can everybody hear the question? She's, she's, uh, she's saying, aren't the people the church? But uh, if, if I can. Uh, 
clarify a little bit, the church in Scripture is, is um, uh, made up of the people of God, which is what you're thinking of, right? But the church in Scripture is a hierarchical structure. Just like the create, remember all the, the created creature distinction, everything's a hierarchical structure. So the church just isn't an ill defined or undefined group of people. It is a group of people who gather together under particular elders and teachers in a particular location and are called uh, to keep the keys of the kingdom, Matthew 18, according to that. So the church is uh, certainly made up of the people of God, but the church is a hierarchical structure just like the rest of creation. The family is a hierarchical structure, the church is a hierarchical structure, and this is an and, and, and the reason that sphere sovereignty, which is what this is called, is so difficult in uh, American evangelicalism is because we've reduced the church to a storefront and a bunch of people just volunteering to come and go at will. And there's no membership, there's no official teachers, there's no elders, there's no structure to it. And so the covenant falls apart. There's no one for the people of God to covenant with. So you, as the people of God, you covenant with your church. So that's why we read the covenant when we take in church members. Why? Because it's a covenant expression for us to be in covenant with one another. But I'm not covenanting to parent uh, your child. I'm covenanting to teach the gospel to your family. Uh, and if, in the same way that I have limits on that side, uh, the church doesn't get to go out and throw up stop signs and, and tell people what the speed limit is. Right? Because God has given the state the, the right to do that, but it, the state has a very limited right to do it. And so the state always wants to breach the covenant into family and breach the covenant into church. I, I don't know how, Patty, did that help at all? Yeah. Okay, it, okay, so two things in our response. Because remember, I know what everybody wants. It would be great if you could do all the permutations of all the different kinds of gay weddings. Was it my son or, you know, a colleague's son? Uh, is, you know, uh, is it, uh, you know, something that snuck up on me? Is, you know, and could you give me the rules for all the permutations of all the pay? And I can't do it. I'm going to give you the principles, and then before the Lord, you're going to have to uh, allow your conscience a scripturally saturated and informed conscience. Conscience doesn't mean a private feeling. Conscience means that a conscience is virtually saturated in the law of God. Can you do that? So, for instance, you know, I can drink wine and I'm not going to hell. But some people, if they drink it, they're not only going to hell, but they're going to go to Skid Row. They can't do it. Right? Can't do it. Some people could eat meat and some couldn't. Uh, and that's Paul's whole thing in Romans 14. So here are the two things. First of all, you're dealing with everybody you're dealing with in the gay community, whether it be your son, your friend's son, your colleagues at work, you're dealing with an image bearer of God. And you dare not forget that. There is no one that has not been created in God's image. The problem is not that they've lost the image of God. The, is, the problem is that the image of God has been weakened and marred by sin. And so it's difficult for them to see everything that, that the Lord would have them to see so that they could progress in a way that their life flourishes. And you could make some scientific argument just to get started. Well, you know, it's a good thing that the whole place wasn't gay in the beginning or we wouldn't be here. Because it kills humanity. And so the only way now uh, to, for you to have a baby is to borrow it from one of us. And you, and you can be cute about that. I've said that a hundred times and everybody laughs. <laughs> Steve, that's a good one. <laughs> right? But it's just a way to get the conversation going. Right? But they're image bearers. And if you forget that they're image bearers, you know, uh, you, you, you end up in, 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 you know, in all kinds of problems. Uh, and, and let me just give you uh, uh, what it means to be an image bearer. First of all, no demonization. We, 
No demonization. If they're an image bearer of God, you can't turn them into a little demon just because uh, of their sex proclivities. Right? So you don't get to demonize anybody if they're an the image of God. You don't get to disrespect them. These are all D words, so it'll be easy if you remember. You don't get to disrespect people. Uh, wasn't that 1 Peter 3.15? Uh, uh, make a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and respect. So no disrespect, please. It's all respectful conversation. Gentle conversation. No disrespect, no demonization. No devaluation. Do you know what I mean by that? Uh, when you devaluate the image of God, uh, the point is they're just a little bit less human than you. And you've got all these pictures in your head, you know, some, some people who really are just all worked up about sexuality and stuff like that. They get these pictures in their head and it's like, oh, you know, and all of a sudden they're less of a human being. Can't do that. And no dismissal. No demonization, no disrespect, no devaluation, no dismissal. What does that mean? Rosario Butterfield, the Presbyterian minister and his wife, never, ever, ever dismissed she and her partner from their home, ever. She was welcome at all times, and it took years. So we don't dismiss people out of our lives. They're, they're image bearers. You can't do it. You have to stay in the conversation if you're going to deliver the gospel. It's the only way to do it. But you don't compromise either, remember? All right, so they're image bearers. And finally, they're lost sheep. Do you remember how Jesus put this? Lost sheep? Uh, Matthew 9, 36. Look how it's... When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them. So let me just rephrase this for you, okay? Ready? Uh, when he saw the LGBTQ community, he had compassion for them. Why? Because they were harassed and helpless. Who harasses them? Who? Satan. They're the recipients of the attack of the evil one. That's why they're having an identity problem to start with. They don't know who they are, they are, they're upset, they're searching for something, they can't, they don't feel settled, and it causes anxiety and angst uh, and all these things. They're under attack. You have to minister to them. But not only that, they're helpless. They're like what? Like sheep without a shepherd. And what does a shepherd do? Protects the sheep, feeds the sheep, Make sure the sheep don't get lost. Builds protection around the sheep. Now that was Jesus. And he's not talking about believers. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them. He's talking about the great unwashed here. He's talking, right? So whatever your decision is, your approach has to at least include these verses. Are you concerned? Are you considerate? Uh, are you willing not to compromise because you don't get to do that? Uh, are, are, are you uh, going to uh, ridicule people? Uh, are you going to uh, uh, demonize them? Are you going to disrespect? Are you going to devalue them? You can, we don't get to do any of that. Uh, we don't get to treat them as if they're not created in the image of God. And we don't get to treat them as if they're anything but lost sheep who are harassed and helpless and need the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what we do. Now, what are you going to do with your son? He's yours. God gave him to you. If you understand what it means to be the covenant head of your family, you're the shepherd of your family. What are you going to do with that person? You're going to demonize one of your own sheep? You're going to devalue one of your own sheep? You're going to dismiss one of your own sheep? Are you going to disrespect one of your own sheep? You're the shepherd of your family. What are you going to do? 
What are you going to do? So it's not as easy as we thought, is it? It's not as easy as we thought. Any questions about that before we get out of here? All kinds. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, uh, this is what I promise I'll do. Uh, this is what I, prom I, and I promise. And, you, and by the way, this isn't my idea. Uh, uh, one of the officers of the church came to me with this idea. Uh, they said, would you be willing, either on a Sunday night or a Wednesday night, just sit and take any question that comes to you about anything like this or anything else anybody can think of? And the answer is, of course. Happy to do it. And it can range all over the map. I don't care. Uh, and so if you want... Do you want a, a Q&A on just this alone? Or, or would you at the end of this class like a, a Q&A that would just range across to anything? Anything. Anything? All right. I promise you that's what we'll do. The last class, we will sit here and I don't care what the question is. All right? I'll answer the question. Doesn't matter what it is. I mean within range. Don't be crazy. All right? <laughs> okay. All right. Let's, let's pray. Lord, I, I, uh, I know this is a hard area for people and um, we're feeling pressure on every side. Uh, people are accusing us of hating people that we don't hate. Uh, we know that um, these lifestyles are not honoring to you and, and, and will probably hurt people, but we're having uh, uh, a struggle figuring out how to communicate that, how to, how to stand for the gospel without... Uh, uh, disrespecting people, uh, so help us with that. Uh, to the extent that this is in our families, we have powerful feelings sometimes of anger um, and, and hurt, uh, not knowing what to do with members of our own family. It feels sometimes like betrayal. It feels like we failed as parents sometimes. It, uh, we just don't know what to do. And so I pray that through your spirit uh, that we will begin to think through these things and help us to be in it for the long haul. Help us to stay in the conversations with each other. Uh, I'm sure that we all have wisdom uh, uh, that you will give us through the gift of prophecy that we've talked about on Sunday nights where the word is applied to each of us in our friendships and our conversations. Hear us now, I pray, for the sake of Jesus. Amen. Amen.